I think that when the ultimate and only focus is getting money, then you put a lot of stress, undue stress on the process and leave a lot of the enjoyment, the human aspect and the relationship building outside of the table. And that is the problem because people have energies that can be felt way before you show up in the room. And so if the whole thing is about just the money, then you're going to taint that process and people are going to be able to see it. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world insider podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hello, Passion Maker. This is Miriam Shulman, your curator of inspiration, and you're listening to episode number 202 of the Inspiration Place podcast. I am so grateful that you're here. Today's guest is an award-winning New York-based contemporary art advisor, author, and curator. She's the author of How Creativity Rules the World. A Harvard Law School graduate, originally from Venezuela, she's been selected by Complex Magazine as one of the 20 power players in the art world. She was also named by Art News as one of the visionaries who gets to shape the art world. She's written for publications such as Entrepreneur, Huffington Post, Elle, Forbes, Artnet, Cultured Magazine, Departures, and the Gulf Coast Journal of Literature and Fine Arts from the University of Houston, Texas. For several years, our guest taught her creativity course in companies, and in 2019, she launched Jumpstart, an online program on creativity for entrepreneurs based on years of research and observation in both the areas of business and art. She's curated exhibitions on three continents and in 2019 created and hosted The Sea Files, a TV and streaming series for PBS's new station, All Arts. Please welcome to the inspiration place, Maria Brito. Well, hello, Maria, and welcome to the show. Hello, Miriam. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, this is exciting because I think we're going to have a fun talk and a great time. And I am excited to roll with you. 100%. So one of the reasons I was particularly interested in having you on is I'm actually publishing a book with the same team that you just (laughs) finished working with. Did you know that? Awesome. I did not know. How serendipitous is that? Yeah. Except I think you did it a lot faster than I did. You must like, then I was reading your bio. I was like, oh, she's a lawyer. I bet she has (laughs) better negotiation skills. How did she get get this accomplished so fast? Because I think you, did you sign your contract last year? Is that right? I signed my contract with them in, I don't remember the truth is, yes, it was last year, but I had already written the book. So it was more like, here's a book. And, you know, my agent went and said like, you know, the book is done. So you want it or not, you know? So that was kind of like, I had, a, but I, in truth and the honest answer is that I am a person who works really fast because that's the nature of how I feel. And you just move to New York City and you'll see if you don't move fast, the city is going to leave you behind and you don't want that. Oh, 100%. (laughs) So I signed my contract in June. I had not written the book and they originally wanted to give me like an April of this year deadline for finishing the manuscript. And I told my agent, I do not work well with long deadlines. (laughs) You got to move this up. So, um, and initially we did have an October release date and now it's not till February, which it feels like a long time from now. But the truth is, I think I actually needed that time. This is my first book. So, well, you'll see what, I mean, it's uh, all... works out in the end for whatever reason. I'm not sure, you know, the publishing industry is very old school still, right? And so they have all this type of deadlines and uh, structures and specific ways of doing things. And 
I don't know. I mean, I, for uh, like they want to modernize themselves, but they haven't done that. Mm. So, you know, authors who want to work with traditionally publishing, you know, like traditionally published that they want to work with big publishing houses, they always are at a little bit of the mercy of these very long leads and long deadlines yeah. and whatever. Yeah. So, you know, but it is a process. And it is. If, if you don't really have a lot of patience, it can be extremely frustrating. <laughs> Did you have the cover picked out ahead of time too? No, because I chose to work with a contemporary artist that I, it's a friend that she is mentioned in the book and I worship her. So I said, I want my artist, I mean, my friend artist to design the cover. And, uh, you know, they had to agree on that and they did. And so this artist is a 32 year old artist who also works extremely fast. And so she worked at a very, very fast speed. And then it was kind of like putting together sort of like the title and how it would fit in her work, right? That was kind of a little bit of a collaborative standpoint between the designer that they used and the artist, but that was also kind of fast. So there were not this kind of like things that instead of moving the ball and keep, you know, keep rolling with things, you know, sometimes you find this moments in processes like this where you're like, I don't know why I'm stuck in this limbo for this long, but it didn't happen in my case. I never felt I'm stuck or like I'm not moving forward. I always had the sense of continuity and that we were doing things in a in a place and in a pace that I felt comfortable with my speed. And I think that it's you know, a lot of people seek perfection. A lot of people seek for these things that that they wanted to keep going on until they have this kind of perceived notion that it has reached this level of perfection. And the truth is, it's never perfect. I have a friend who's writing a book too in London, and he hired a couple of different editors at this point. And it's been like, but I want it to be perfect. So it's never going to be. So I think maybe you are in a space where you don't really want to go and do the work of getting an agent and selling the damn thing, you know, because that could be also a protection mechanism, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you don't want to go and do the real work, which is, you know, sell the damn book because we're not going to be able to know what's in the book unless you sell it. And if you've been working on it for four years, you know, I don't know. I mean, is that, are you trying to beat, you know, I mean, Liz Gilbert and like, you know, what, what are you trying to do with that manuscript, right? I mean, I, I think a lot of people get lost in the, in the minutia rather than, taking action, which is what at the end of the day brings results. Yeah. And you bring up Liz Gilbert. One of the things she talks about, I think she talks about this in Big Magic, but I've also heard her speak about this as a talking point in interviews, is that when she decided she was going to be an author, that was her promise that she was going to be an author. But when she struggles with the writing, she reminds herself, well, I never promised myself I'd be good. I just promised I would do it. (laughs) I think that's brilliant. Right. And she may not have put it exactly that way, but that's the gist. And then I've heard Julia Cameron say very similar things is that I will take care of the quantity and God will take care of the quality. It's just put it out there. I mean, I know that Liz worked on it, pray, love a lot because she said that she worked and worked and worked on that manuscript. So she may have moved on right now from that because once you know, you reach the level of successes that she's reached, it's easier, right? I mean, you don't really have to spend three years with a manuscript in your hands or whatever. But at the beginning, she did spend an enormous amount of time working on on that book. And I think that it's always this willingness that human beings have. It it has to be self-directed, right? To navigate between both things like how good do I want this to be? And how soon do I want this to come to the surface? Because look, you never really know what's going to happen. You really know how the reader is going to, or, you know, or, or the collector or the venture capitalist, you never know what they're thinking, right? I mean, you know what you're doing and you know how good you could be. If I were to venture tomorrow to like, let's say, write a novel, which I would love to, but I don't have the skills. Like, I don't really think I could write dialogue. I would have to go to a very profound, you know, and, and deep training 
with coaches or teachers or whatever to get to a point where I can read and like I can write a novel. So it'll take me like two or three years at least. But, you know, nonfiction, which I do every day and I write every day and I've been writing for years, it's sort of like, you know, a much straightforward path. So the thing is also projects like this, books like this, in truth, they are never finished because every day, if you're really passionate about your subject, every day you're going to find something new. And so, you know, I mean, I don't know if you had this happen because you, you sounds like you went really fast. Did you have to like go through a developmental edit where they completely wanted to have you rewrite things? That happened to me. No, 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 no. Because, you know, I was pretty sure about what I wanted the book to look like. I have put together a proposal that, you know, my agent praised the proposal. So I don't even have to change it. I just sent it like, it's like, I did everything. And I was like, this is the book. You know what I mean? It's like, so when so, they came back with the edits, you were like, no, thank you. The edits or? were not developmental. They were oh, like, you know, copy oh, edits. it was copy edits, expansions. Like we would like to hear more about this or we don't need this. I mean, they were not like, let's just restructure the book. No, it was just like, yeah, there were questions. Like, I don't understand this, right? And, oh, that makes sense. I understand that you don't understand because maybe I didn't explain it right. Or maybe I thought you were like at a place in time that you could have gotten knowledge about this, but you didn't. So as an author, right, you have to have sufficient perspective and be humble enough to say, well, I just really didn't explain my point clearly, yeah. right? Well, I and found so- my message evolving because of that process. Like I felt very grateful as I didn't write a book so that I could perfect my message. I never thought that was good, <laughs> but this is what's happened. You know, like, oh yeah, I don't know why I think that. Let me see if there's research that backs it up or maybe there isn't research that backs up what I'm thinking and I need to take this thought out or this belief out. So Maria, let's get back to your book. Why did you write Creativity Rules the World? You know, I was a corporate attorney like you introduced me. And I sort of like spend many years of my life, you know, going to law school and practicing law in law firms in New York. And this was not what I wanted to do. It was something that I convinced myself because my parents thought that I needed to have a dependable career and something that I could fall back on, you know, and God forbid, I was going to end up being like a starving singer, you know, which is what I wanted to be or a hooker because my mom thought that all those types of, you know, professions like it involved being on a stage. It was just for prostitutes, right? That's what was my mom thought. And so I ended up doing something that was by default. I was not very good at math. I didn't like blood. So I was not going to be like a doctor. And I said, well, I'm very good at writing, reading. And I think, you know, this is a profession that is very well regarded. So let me just go and be an attorney. And I was, but again, as I grew older in the profession, it was miserable. And when I decided to quit, which was a very difficult, as you can imagine, after nine years, it's a very, very solid career, excellent salary, all sorts of perks, no life. But, you know, I mean, some people like to sell their soul to the devil. And, you know, that was like that was not, you know, the reason why I was doing that was not for the money. It was because, you know, this was what my parents thought it was the best for me. And I thought it was the best for me. So when I quit, I had already, you know, the thought that I was going to open an art advisory because I love contemporary art. And since I moved to New York, I was collecting and I was meeting people in the art world and gallery owners, artists, collectors. And I thought it was the whole thing fascinating. And that was 13. I mean, I started collecting 20 years ago, but the kind of me mingling more in the art world, maybe it was 15, 14 years ago, give or take. And I thought it was fascinating, the whole dynamic, the whole idea of like all these artists getting all this incredible records at auction and also how it worked behind the scene, the world of ideas, the world of materializing thoughts in a way that, you know, you put it on a canvas or, and so 
And I saw a couple of people who were working as art advisors and I thought to myself, they suck. They suck. I mean, I still can't believe that they are so bad because it was so transactional the way they treated their clients. And they were sort of like, okay, here it is. Bye. And, you know, let me just get my, my commission. And I was like, there is such a lack of soul into what those people are doing when there is so much opportunity for expansion and growth and to cultivate different relationships and to have a different business model. And so I saw that was my end and um, also writing and utilizing social media, which at the time, absolutely none of those people. And I can guarantee you, I was the first one to work with artists. Like I would go to the studios, photograph them, write about them. I I started doing videos when nobody was doing videos. I had a Facebook account before any of those people even had any. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm the outsider, but I'm going to make sure that people know who I am. And so I started promoting those blog posts like crazy and the imagery that I was taking with a real camera because you know, I was like, I can't, like the iPhone camera was kind of shitty at that time. So I had to go with a real camera. And it's, work still, on the it's still better to use a real lens, I have to say. Like when <laughs> well, I photograph my artwork with a real camera versus my phone, yes. I'm like, huh. Now I wanted to cut in, uh, Maria, because I'm not sure that everyone in our audience knows what a contemporary art advisor mm-hmm. does. So could you define that? Yes. So my job is to be the eyes and ears of the art collectors. And so they hire me so I can tell them what art to buy, where to find the best opportunities in the market, whether it is for the most part, primary market, but also secondary market, which is something that has changed hands. It was owned by someone and someone wants to sell it. So that's secondary market and primary market always comes straight from the gallery. So my clients entrust me with showing them things. And my job is to be everywhere, right? I mean, I go to auctions, I go to galleries, I go to museum shows, I go to artist studios, and I do that pretty much around the world. I mean, now it's like since the pandemic, I haven't traveled as much. I still do, but not as in like crazy. I was like every month I was somewhere outside the U.S., not even outside New York, but outside the U.S. But it's it's different now because like everything sort of happens online. So in that job, what I found that was the most fascinating part, though, is that since working for the clients, but also developing relationships with artists and not uh, yes, directly with them, but, you know, with always with the gallery in the middle. So I started becoming very curious about this artist and I started documenting their processes and ask, asking them questions and writing them down and writing for them in magazines and in my own blog and sort of like building this huge archive, if you will, of direct or observation. And when I... So also the way I run my business and the way my clients who are business owners and entrepreneurs run their businesses and came up with their ideas, I saw the parallels between the creative process, right? Because a lot of people stay and I go back to the question why I wrote the book. And so a lot of people think creative process is when you are in front of a canvas or you are cutting a film or, you know, whatever. But creative process is nothing more than your unique ability to come up with ideas of value that are relevant and that, you know, you can execute. So it doesn't matter if you're a dentist and you need to figure out your next marketing move or how you're going to promote your services, what makes that unique. And I think, I wholeheartedly believe actually that is the most important skill than any human being in in a business, you know, and in a, in a setting where you need to make money for yourself can have because it's not taught in schools. Occasionally, when you get to great business schools or design schools like Stanford Design School or Harvard Business School, they do have certain courses on creativity and entrepreneurship, creativity and design. But this is not something that is taught in art schools. This is not something that is taught in high school. And But it's so needed because we, at the speed that we are changing as a society and as humans, we need to be able to come up with these ideas all the time or else, you know, we become irrelevant and it becomes harder and harder 
to show the world who you are and what you do. And, and you know, it, it requires constant adaptation. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying, I find to be so true. I had a, a friend recently asked me, oh, you do so much, Miriam. How do you have time for your art? And by that, I think she meant my painting. But And my retort to her, I said, well, it's all my art. Like, the business is my art. The podcast is definitely an art form. So I find everything that I do and that I touch is highly creative. Yes. And that's actually the best way to live, in my opinion, because one thing informs the other, right? Like the way you do one thing informs another thing. And it also expands outside of your business and career because you do things in your family life or in your daily life that, you know, require thinking differently, right? And that is the core of what I want to give the world to this book and what I want to show people, right, that they can access and that they can live with. And it's a very, very important thing that we finally break with all the past that says creativity is just for artists or creativity is a God-given talent or creativity is a genetic thing because none of that is true. And it is, again, what I consider to be the number one skill is as an amalgamation of skills, because it's not just one thing, but the, the number one amalgamation of different skills that people will always be able to rely on to get them where they want to be. One of the, though, the takeaways I got from your book, and this may be your next book, Maria, is how <laughs> connected you are. So a lot of times in your storytelling, you would talk about how you would get quiet with yourself and you would, you know, get very quiet and tap into yourself. And then you would have a vision that would remind you of a somebody, you, you know, that was able to help you. And so that's why I was like, well, damn girl, she's like working, like, I don't know, the Harvard alumni network, or I don't know, like, this is, this is like definitely a sign of somebody who's very well connected. So would you agree that your ability to network has also helped you? You know, it's a great question. And Somebody, it's so funny you say that. Somebody who wrote a review for my book said, well, but she never tells us how she finds all those rich people or whatever, right? And I find that fascinating and hilarious because here's what, right? And when I came to the States, I didn't know anybody because I had never lived here. And my parents were from and still are from Venezuela and still live there. And I had really no connections, right? So then... I go through this Harvard world, which is fantastic. It's a great networking place, but I also as a foreigner and I had to work twice as hard because man, that was hard. I mean, law school was difficult and, you know, it was really hard. And also not only the system, the language, but the system. So, okay. So it's not that I was the most networker of the whole thing, right? And then I moved to New York City and I have many friends from Harvard who are in New York City too. And then they invite me out or whatever. And we go out and we network with more lawyers. So it was a very self-contained mm. world. My husband was introduced to me by a Harvard friend. So it, went, it ended up being small. But when I left that law firm, my number one, a number one or number two concern in my list of things that I had to do was to meet people. And I did, I mean, I felt such freedom when I left that law firm because I was tied to their schedules, whatever the partners wanted me to do, my clients, I had to work 24 seven. And so since I didn't have that anymore, my job was to go and shake hands with people and to insert myself in all these circles that were completely unknown to me, which was the blessing. Because when you get into those places, you don't have any preconceived notions of who they are, how they misbehave or behave or, you know, so it was like, everybody's great. Let me just shake hands. Right. And I was not shy at all. I was just like, I came in and I was like, hello, I'm Maria Brito. I'm here to demystify the art world and I'm blogging and I'm an art advisor. And everybody was sort of like, oh, this girl is so cute with her accent. And like, I was like, yeah, you know, I just tried to be genuinely interested, which I was, but also again, like my biggest blessing was that I had nothing 
to stop me or like there was like if somebody would have said, well, don't go to that person because that guy is a jerk, right? Or like, go to, don't go to that woman because she will never do business with you, right? I didn't have anybody telling me that. And if they did, I was like, okay, but I want to see now. I want to see for myself. So that whole thing turned one thing into another, right? And so that's how I started opening up my own doors. And occasionally you get to someone who sort of like falls in love with your mission because again, remember, this was pre-Instagram. This was pre-everything online available for everybody. This was pre-artsy, pre, you know, all those things. So the information was really hard to find. And I had, you know, what, 16 waking hours. I had the stamina of a lawyer to do all these things, to find the information and package it in different ways and talk to people about it. And it, I think that resonated really well with people who thought they were shunned from the art world because, you know, it's intimidating at the beginning or whatever, with people who had already been a part of the art world, but they needed a fresh perspective on things. And so the pure truth, how did I become so connected is because I have been doing it already for 13 years and I am willing, I'm open. And I, in right now I'm, I'm like, I think I'm so busy sometimes that I'm, it's not the same amount of networking that I do because I'm so busy with business and things that are happening. But I consider that that was an incredibly important thing, obviously for me that you've no, you've noticed it. And, and so how you being in the right place at the right time, you do it yourself. You know what I mean? It's like, how do you get to that, you know, those like rooms where all these power people and like, how do you get all these amazing clients? First, by not being afraid of saying what you do and how you do it. And second, by, because you get tired to hear yourself, but they don't know. That's the thing, right? Like if you repeat your, elevator pitch, if you will, to yourself a million times, you're going to throw up and say, who cares? But they don't know. They don't know. That's the thing. You're getting to meet these people for the first time. So what, you know, Jay-Z said once to Warren Buffett in an interview is like this genius thing that I did is like, I never gave up. And that was the genius thing that I did. Yeah. (laughs) There's one thing you said earlier that I want to cycle back to. And this is something that I teach my artists when, so my artists are primarily self-representing artists. Some of them have gallery relationships, but you as an art broker, you're basically, so an art consultant, you're basically brokering the art sale. Would you say that's a correct characterization? I go through the gallery for the most part. I never work directly with artists. In okay. a very rare occasions, I mean, it has happened that I have bought directly from an artist, but for me, not for my clients. Got and it. here's why, because I want everything for my clients to be kosher, perfect. Uh, if they have a problem, they can go back to the gallery. I'm just a, a middleman who provides an incredible amount of access because the market is way too hot and the inventory is not as big and everybody wants the same thing. So I give access and I also give recommendations of young artists who are starting and they are in young galleries and not so easy to find sometimes. And so that's pretty much where I am. Occasionally, as I said, I work directly with artists, but again, just for me, not for my clients. Okay, so here's the question though. Earlier, you were talking about how other art consultants are more transactional. And the thing that I talk to my artists is how they should be focusing when they're selling the art, they should be focusing on the experience, not the transaction. And it sounds like you have a similar philosophy. Can you share, Maria, how you do that? Look, this question actually came up recently with someone else that I know. And This is the complicated times that we live in a capitalist society, in a capitalist country, right? It's like you have to think about the money because it's very important. I don't think creativity and business and money should be like disassociated or money is not dirty. I love rich people. Come, thank you. You know, like they're my clients. Fantastic. But I think that when the ultimate and only focus is getting money, then you put a lot of stress, induced stress on the process and leave a lot of the enjoyment, the human aspect and the relationship building 
outside of the table. And that is a problem because people have energies that can be felt way before you show up in the room. And so if the whole thing is about just the money, then you're going to taint that process and people are going to be able to see it, especially rich people. <laughs> they have a very good radar for these things, right? So how do you separate these things or how do you make the whole process more enjoyable is by, first of all, I think gratitude is very important. And I think being able to express yourself through art and sell it and make a living out of that is a privilege. It's a really big privilege. Not because I am, I'm not the kind of person at all, and you know this from my book, that subscribe to the whole, you know, myth of the starving artist. And like, no, actually, I think the opposite. If artists are good and they are smart, just a minimum amount of creativity with marketing, they can be really wealthy really quick. But I think that if you have the gratitude to understand that putting your ideas in a frame, in a canvas, in a sculpting something, whatever it is you do, video art, I don't know. And having someone pay for that is an incredible achievement if you think about it. So putting your gratitude in the whole process of it, like knowing that you have somebody who wants to back you up, that celebrates what you did, that says, I can live with this. I can recognize it. I can put it on my Instagram. I can hang it on my living room. It's a big thing. So we start with the idea of being grateful for that and enjoying what's happening along the way, having the conviction that our work has worth and that someone is going to pay what we think, you know, the, the labels and the prices that we are adding to that. And I think that it's important for artists who are selling, you know, for themselves to to have that kind of attitude. And I don't know if they are selling online. I'm not sure, you know, what type of channels they're using. And I guess if they don't have a gallery, then for the most part, for people to be able to find them, they are selling online and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, a lot of people want to follow a very traditional path and have gallery and split 50-50. A lot of people have all sorts of different ways. People want to do NFTs please go ahead. You know, it's all a very, very big spectrum that artists have to play with right now. But if you have that right attitude of the human, which at the end of the day is the representation of what it means to be an artist, right? Artists are always attuned to the the here and now and expressing that human aspect through their work. Very nice. Okay. I have one last question before we wrap up. So there are a lot of beautiful stories about different artists and also people who are in in the business industry, like Mm -hmm. Estee Lauder. So I'm trying to think which one I most want to ask you about. I think the one I wanted to ask you about the most was your emotional reaction to the artist, Micheline Thomas. Mm -hmm. So can you share with our listeners who she is and why you had such a strong reaction when you visited her studio? I think they would enjoy hearing about that. Micheline Thomas is a Black artist. Uh, She is in her late 40s. She was born and raised in New Jersey. And... Micheline grew up in the 70s with disco music. It was a time also where, you know, Black people became exuberant. It was the post-civil rights era where, you know, it was a celebration of the hair and the clothes and the music. And also hip hop was being, you know, in the mix, in the Bronx happening. And also all these things were so interesting for culture. And Micheline went she wanted to be an artist and uh, she graduated from her, you know, master's at her MFA at Yale. And she went to have a very, and she still has an incredible career. And so part of her practice, her main medium is painting mixed media and she's done everything. She's done sculpture, She's on photography, she's on video, and a really big part of her practice is the installations. And so she created an installation many years ago that she has 
replicated in several settings. Like she had a solo show at the Brooklyn Museum and it was there. She had a solo show at the Toronto Art Museum. It was there. She, you know, so it was this African pattern fabrics that covered the for the furniture. She wanted to replicate the living room of her childhood where she lived in New Jersey with her mom. And there were all these vinyl records from black artists and disco and hip hop. And well, it's a kaleidoscope of like forms and shapes and it's beautiful. The aesthetic is incredible. So she invited me to her studio in Brooklyn and I went and I sat down in like that chair in one of the installations that I had already seen in uh, the Brooklyn Museum. And I started to cry because I felt so much energy that represented both the toughness of having to grow up in a low-income neighborhood as a Black girl who also is queer. So things were not easy, right? Her mom was a drug addict. I mean, it was a complicated thing, right? And on the other hand is the incredible success that she has. She's incredibly successful and wealthy and well-regarded and ambitious. And so, you know, it's this empathy that I felt, right? Like it was so palpable and it was a transmission of everything that had happened in that living room in the 70s, which is in a way one of the most incredible things that any artist can do. If an artist can take you to a place like that, that artist has done everything already, you know, at least in my opinion. So I think that what these artists that I have met in in my 13 years in this business have taught me not only is creativity, but also how to embrace this different points of view and how to be empathetic when you see the world one way, they see the world another way. But you want to be able to take on those points of view because they are definitely important for anybody who wants to succeed in business and in life. When you just see things one way and one way only, it's a very, very it's it's not only stressful for you because you try to find silos where you can be like, I'm gonna go with my people who think just like me, right? And that's a problem. It's a problem because. You know, both sides, if you think about how politicized things are, both sides of this equation in the U.S. right now think that they are right. And they want to convince you, right? Like they want to convince you they are right. But is there an opportunity to think that they each have an argument that is valid and we can actually take from it, from each piece a little bit and see how to reconcile the extreme paradoxes, right? Like all these things a better life. And I think at the end of the day, that's a whole lot more fruitful for society and for us as humans than than trying to live our lives with the extreme positions that we have been forced, honestly, to live with. Because I didn't choose extreme positions. I don't want to be, you know, brainwashed in either way or, you know, I just want to make sure that I continue to serve my clients happily and I continue to learn because if you're not learning, you're not, not growing. That's it. That's It's like you might as well die. <laughs> you know, if, you're, if you're not learning, you're not growing. That's for sure. All right. Well, this is a great place to wrap up. Thank you, Maria, for joining us here today. Everyone, Maria Brito, How Creativity Rules the World. We will make sure we link to the book in the show notes. It's also available independent bookstores. If your bookstore doesn't have it, just ask them to order it. If you want to support your local bookstore, I'm sure they'd be happy to do that. Maria, do you have any last words for our listeners before we call this podcast complete? Yeah, I want everybody who's listening to know that everything that you have inside of you is perfect and whole to succeed in this world of art and business and you should definitely embrace them both and you will save a lot of heartache if you start by believing that you have both skills that you can be an artist who runs the business that you are entrepreneur entrepreneurial and that you can continue doing what you love and and have a nice living and really that's important Okay. Well, thank you so much for being with me here today. Thank you. 
All right, everyone. Thanks so much also for being with us today. I will see you the same time, same place next week. Stay inspired. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com.